So here we are in the digital age of commerce. How does it feel? Does it feel like the Shangri-La we were promised? Do you remember 15 years ago when e-commerce just began to take hold? They said, we'll be making money while we sleep, right? We'll be able to deliver perfectly consistent customer experiences. We'll be able to measure and track those experiences. Now, 15 years later, we've got mobile devices where we can not only communicate with customers more places than ever before, we can deliver customer experiences in more places than ever before. And just ahead, now with streaming video, the television and the smartphone are merging together where we can deliver customer experiences through many, many different methods. It must all be perfect, right? Our jobs are so easy now. Well, if that's the case, why is it then, if we've got more data than ever before, more ways to communicate than ever before, more ways to deliver customer experiences than ever before, why is it then that customer loyalty in almost any industry or category that you look at is actually lower than ever before? What's up with that? Well, don't worry, though. Every year, there's some new vendor or technology or tool that's going to solve it for us. Right? Remember, it used to be data-driven customer experience management. That was going to be the solution. And then all of a sudden, the next thing you know, the data is overwhelming. It's going to be big data analytics or some other tool that's a constantly moving target. We can't ever seem to get our hands on it. Well, I have some good news for you for a change. The real key to lasting customer loyalty and inspiring customer experiences is not a moving target. It's something that's hardwired into all of us, and it hasn't changed for thousands of years. And in fact, digital technology has only made it more powerful. And by the end of our talk this morning, you'll better understand that if we align and support the way we are wired by evolution, we can deliver inspiring experiences and have consistent growth and have lasting loyalty. We'll just have to align ourselves with it. So what is this magic? What is this? The insight, what is this perspective that is going to change the way we approach? Well, it turns out that social psychologists conducting research in over 40 countries have in the, just the last few years uncovered a universal process that all humans use to perceive, interact, and form relationships with one another. And it turns out this is not well known outside academia. And they've been able to show that it actually drives over 80% of human behavior. Whether we are interacting with one another in a business context or even thousands of years ago, when primitive humans would come upon another person, it turns out there were two kinds of decisions they need to make very quickly and very accurately with very little information. First, we need to determine what are the intentions of that other person towards me, using all of our senses, relying on their facial expressions, their tone of voice, their body language, their appearance. What are their intentions towards me? Are they a friend or a foe? Going to help me or hurt me? Give something to me or take something from me? Or said another way, what degree of warmth can I pick up about their intentions towards me? And then, given what I think their intentions may be, what ability do I have to carry out those intentions? Are they smart or foolish, fast or slow, strong or weak? Or what degree of competence do they have? And it turns out these basic perceptions of warmth and competence have been crucial throughout human history. And in the original game of Survivor, or as you call it here, Super Bibiantes, 10,000 years ago, these are the most important decisions that humans made every day. Not only when they encountered strangers, but also in their interactions with people in their community, in their family, and in their tribe. Because in the original game of Super Bibiantes, if we got kicked out of the tribe, we didn't get to go to Redemption Island like they do on TV. Right? More likely, we were dead within a few weeks because we're so dependent on one another for food, clothing, shelter, and protection. And so through evolution, humans became hardwired to make these decisions automatically, almost without thinking. We do it all day, every day, without even realizing it. So let me explain a little bit more about how this works. Actually, warmth you can think of as a whole category of perceptions. Things like, is this person honest? Are they trustworthy? Are they acting in my best interest? Are they only looking out for themselves? And the list could go on. You can think of all the different perceptions you might have about someone's intentions towards you. Then competence is all the things that you would think. Intelligence, resourcefulness, strength, creativity, reliability, and the list could go on. And it turns out that these warmth and competence perceptions actually lead to a predictable pattern of emotions. And it's those emotions that actually cause our behavior. 
So let me illustrate. Think for a moment about someone you know who's very warm, very friendly, very trustworthy, but is also extremely competent and skilled and capable at what they do. This typically causes us to feel pride and admiration. We are drawn to them. We become loyal to them. Now, if we flip that around and think of someone with all the same competence and skill, but is cold and unfriendly and we're not sure that we can trust them, typically this causes us to feel envy and jealousy. They might be a threat to me. I'm not sure they can trust them, but I've got to go along to get along. And the behavior that comes from that and grudging cooperation. On the other side of that, if we think of someone who's very warm and trustworthy, but really not very reliable, this causes us to feel pity and sympathy. They can't really help us. They can't really hurt us. And the behavior that comes from that is indifference and neglect. And of course, the worst combination that we all hate is if you're cold and incompetent. That just makes us angry, and we want to avoid you at all costs. And so these basic patterns of perception lead to these emotions are driving our behavior every day, whether we realize it or not. Let me give you a few examples that may sound familiar. We can actually plot these warmth on the vertical axis and competence on the horizontal axis. Now, if I said the name to you, Donald Trump, a name you may have heard in the news recently, if you're like most people in the United States, most people would say that Donald Trump is not a very warm and friendly and trustworthy person, but he's probably very wealthy, so he's probably very competent. And this is where Americans see Donald Trump. On the other hand, if you remember the name Paula Abdul, she was the compassionate but easily confused judge on American Idol. We see her as very warm but not very competent. Someone like Oprah Winfrey, we see as very warm and very competent, has a loyal following. And then if you remember the actor Charlie Sheen, who's been through all kinds of trouble and bizarre behavior, Charlie, we see as cold and incompetent. And so these perceptions that we can easily identify with celebrities, we are also making these judgments every day as we interact with one another. And it turns out that it's not just other people that we perceive this way. Research and studying warmth and competence have shown that humans are wired to perceive everything around us through this lens. So for example, researchers have recently shown that animals we perceive through this same lens. So for instance, our dogs and cats and horses we perceive as very warm and very competent. The rats and snakes and lizards we hold in great contempt. Lions and tigers and bears are competent but cold. But the place you don't want to be is up in the left-hand side because that's where the pigs and cows and sheep that we eat for lunch every day end up. And it's also been shown that actually computers and even websites are judged through this lens of warmth and competence, guiding our behavior on realizing it every day. And so when I first became exposed to this work back in 2009, it occurred to me if these warmth and competence perceptions are guiding so much of our behavior, how could they not be guiding our perceptions of companies and brands and our customer experiences? And so I reached out to one of the foremost experts on warmth and competence in the world, Dr. Susan Fisk at Princeton University. And we spent the next three years studying over 40 companies and brands, evaluating how their companies were perceived by their customers from a warmth and competence standpoint. And here's what we found. Up in the upper right-hand quadrant, we found lots of household names, Johnson & Johnson, Hershey, Coca-Cola, Amazon, and several nonprofits. In the lower left-hand side, we found many large banks, oil companies and insurance companies, all the companies we hear so often sorry, we are frustrated with in society. In the lower right-hand side, we found Mercedes and Rolls-Royce and Rolex. And it's important to point out at this point that these are the perceptions of the total adult population. If you are an owner of a Mercedes or a Rolex, you may not see them this way, but for most people, that is very affluent and out of reach and less approachable. And at least in the United States, what we found in the upper left-hand quadrant was many government-subsidized entities like the Postal Service and the national train service that might not continue to uh, exist without those public sub subsidies. This past summer, we also conducted research on 16 more companies here in Europe, in Germany, France, the UK, and the Netherlands. And here's what we found. Again, in the upper right-hand quadrant, we found many nonprofit organizations, McDonald's, Ford, Renault. You see in the left-hand side, all of the banks. The right-hand side, many luxury brands. And again, up in the upper left-hand side, subsidized government public sector organizations. So the same pattern that we see in how we perceive people and animals also drives our perceptions towards companies and brands. And while it's all very interesting that they show up in similar quadrants, perhaps it was one important and much more critical from our perspective is that when we roll up all of that data and look at how it impacts customer perception, customer purchase intent, and customer loyalty, we find that over 50% of all purchase intent and loyalty can be explained by four basic human perceptions. 
warmth, competence, capable, and competent. Four human perceptions, warm, friendly, competent, and capable. Before we talk about price, before we talk about quality, before we talk about convenience, before we talk about location, or any of those other things we spend so much of our time trying to communicate and deliver in customer experience, the human side of the equation is making up over 50% of our behavior. And so perhaps it's no wonder that despite we've got more data than ever before, more ways to communicate than ever before, we've got less loyalty than ever before. Perhaps we've been missing half the picture, the half the picture that relates to the human side of our choices. And when I was exposed to this, it really shocked me. It caused me to challenge and wonder all the training and education I'd received during my career at large companies, that perhaps maybe 50% of everything that I had been taught and trained was either no longer true or may not have ever been true. And that perhaps there is a different way for us to do business where we can have loyalty and great customer experiences and growth without having to cut and slash and drive and twist. And it inspired me to want to share this message with others. And there's perhaps no better way to explain how this works in the real world than to share an actual story. Back in August of 2012, Teresa Cook lay dying in a hospital bed in Nashua, New Hampshire. And by her side was her 21-year-old grandson. Teresa was in the final stages of pancreatic cancer, which wreaks havoc on the digestive system, causing a loss of appetite and rapid weight loss exactly the time where the body needs strength to fight the tumors. And so Brandon was trying to do whatever he could to get his grandmother to eat something. But she was resisting. She said, this hospital food is awful. I want no part of it. But Brandon persisted, grandmother, you must eat something. And finally, she said, well, there is one thing. If you could get me my favorite food, I'll give that a try. He said, no problem, grandmother. What is it? I'll take care of it right away. She said, I could go for a bowl of clam chowder in a bread bowl from the Panera Bread Shop. Brandon said, no problem. He got on the phone right away, called up the Panera Bread Shop in Nashville, New Hampshire, and said, I'd like to place an order for clam chowder to take out. And it was a long pause. And he said, I'm sorry. During the summer, we only make clam chowder on Friday. Could you give us a call back on Friday? And Brandon said, no, you don't understand. My grandmother is very ill. If we don't get some food in her, she may not be with us on Friday. And so the manager got on the line, Susan Fortier. And she said, no problem. Come right over. We'll have it ready for you when you get here. And they did have it ready. And in addition, Susan gave Brandon a box of cookies. And she said, there's no charge. You just let us know if you need more clam chowder, and we'll be here for you. And he did let her know, because Teresa Cook had more clam chowder on that Friday and the following Tuesday. And it wasn't until Saturday, August 18th, that Teresa Cook quietly passed away with her family by her side. Clam chowder has sustained her for perhaps another week. And it was just a bowl of clam chowder. And it was just another week. But for Brandon and his grandmother, it was literally a matter of life and death, one they'd never forget. And it turns out there are a lot of other people that would never forget as well. Because on that first Tuesday, Brandon sent a little thank you note over to the folks at the Panera Bread Shop. And he sent that thank you note on his Facebook page. And what do you imagine happened next? Within a few days, over 800,000 people from around the world had liked that post. Nearly 35,000 had posted comments, many of them saying things like, this is why I am proud to work at Panera. This is why I'm taking my family to Panera Bread Shop for dinner tonight. Five sentences, eight lines of text, a short gesture. What accounts for this tremendous outpouring of emotion and behavior? Was it the quality of the clam chowder? The location of the store, the speed of the service, the price? No, of course, it wasn't any of those things. It was a compassionate act of warmth towards another human. And we are wired to respond much more strongly to demonstrations of warmth than competence, because warmth was much more predictive of our survival in evolution. So despite all that we are taught and trained to tell us that all of our competence is responsible for our success, it's actually our warmth, our trustworthiness, our demonstration of goodwill towards others that is far more responsible for our success and that is far more effective at motivating others. And so what can we take away from this? Well, stories like this and all of our research have told us that in fact people were the first brands, faces were the first logos, and all the branded trade and commerce we've been engaged in for the last several thousand years is simply an adaptation of the way that evolution 
wired us to interact and form relationships with one another. And so in fact, we can say every human is a brand and every brand is human. The way our brains are wired to interact and form loyalty to them is exactly the same. And if you think about it, it makes sense. For most of human history, commerce between people was conducted face to face. That's where we picked up all of that warmth and competence information from facial expressions and tone of voice and body language and all of that. And the, it was a relationship between the merchant and the customer, an interdependent relationship, honestly, that if something went wrong, they had to look out for one another. We didn't have credit cards and direct deposit. You had to pay with IOUs. And if a customer was wronged by a merchant in a small community, usually it got worked out pretty quickly. Because if you didn't make it right, pretty much everyone in town would know about it by Sunday church. And he'd come under pressure to make it right, or run out, be run out of town and risk his livelihood. And so the decisions we made in those days were as much about the person we were dealing with as it was the product or service we were buying. And this worked great for thousands of years. And then a little something called the Industrial Revolution came along and changed everything. Let's go back and take an example. Imagine, for instance, a few hundred years ago, the cobbler that literally made shoes for each person, one shoe at a time, knew that customer by name, had that face-to-face -face interaction, formed that relationship. Then comes along the Industrial Revolution, mass production, mass distribution, mass communication. The shoes are made in the factory. They're shipped across the country. We don't see the people that make or sell us the shoes. To where we fast forward now, we don't even see the shoes themselves. We buy them online from Zappos or Amazon, and they show up in a box. If we don't like them, we send them back. And along the way, it's almost been the mass dehumanization of commerce between people. But now, within the last few years, something's changing. With the emergence of e-commerce, mobile devices, and social networks, again, we now have information about the people we are buying companies and brands that we're doing business with. And for the first time in 150 years, the world is becoming wired through the internet, the way that evolution wired us to interact with one another. It's a relationship renaissance where, again, we're making more of our decisions based on what we know and hear from others. And it's not so much that if someone has a bad experience that everyone in town will know about it by the end of the day, but everybody in the country could know about it by the end of the hour. It's warmth and competence on steroids, turbocharged by digital technology. And it requires us to do things differently. And it's taking us back to the future, to a time where our commerce and our interactions with customers are looking more like they did before the Industrial Revolution than they have for the past 100 years. Here's another story from my own experience that illustrates how this works from a customer experience standpoint. It was the summer of 2006 that I first learned the tremendous success that Starbucks has had around the world is probably not due to the quality of its coffee, the location of its stores, or its price. At the time, I was senior vice president of marketing for Aramark Corporation, a large food service company that provides food service in stadiums and hospitals and schools and universities. And at the time, Aramark was a licensee of Starbucks, operating 75 locations on college campuses. And the problem was that Aramark was about to lose their license because we were not delivering the kind of customer experience that Starbucks demanded and that they were able to deliver in their own stores. And so in a last ditch effort to preserve the relationship, Starbucks invited a handful of senior executives from Aramark to go and visit their headquarters in Seattle and to spend a few days learning about their process and their approach. And we expected to hear all about how they chose their coffee beans and designed their stores and produced their coffee. And we certainly did hear a lot of that. But the thing that stuck with us most, the thing that was missing, the missing ingredient, was how they delivered the customer experience that they did. They told us about something called a little green apron book, which as the name suggests was a little green book that fit in the pocket of their apron for each employee. And in that book, they talked about five ways of being, five things that each employee was expected to demonstrate not only to customers, but also to each other in their environment. Things like being welcoming and genuine and considerate and knowledgeable. And in that book, there were five little cards, business size card, size cards. And on the front was a description of each way and being, and on the back were some blank lines. And they were expected to catch each other doing something right every day, whether it's remembering the name of a customer, offering to pick up a shift for a colleague, or just offering a kind word to someone who's having a difficult day. And what surprised us is this was not just a good idea that sat on a shelf or in a drawer, but literally they had a, an apron in the back room and they would present five or six of these cards to each other every day, encouraging and recognizing them for their actions. 
At the end of the month, they would be gathered up and sent to the district office. And at the district office, they would be written up into stories that we shared throughout the organization, encouraging, recognizing, and inspiring others how to do this in their stores. And there's one store and one story in particular that stuck with us. It was about a store on the West Coast. This store had a regular customer named Pete. Pete would come in a few times a week, would drink his coffee in the corner, read the newspaper, and after an hour or so, he would go home. This went on for several years, and everyone knew Pete, welcomed him by name. And then a few weeks went by, and Pete didn't come in. And they started to ask themselves, has anyone seen Pete? He said, I think he has a daughter in LA. Maybe he's visiting his daughter on vacation. A few more weeks went by, still no Pete. And then one afternoon, a young woman came in. And she said, does anyone here know a customer named Pete? And they said, sure, we know Pete. Where's he been? Has he been on vacation? She said, no, I'm sorry, I'm Pete's daughter. And I'm sorry to say that he had a heart attack a few weeks ago and passed away. And I'm here to go through his affairs and put his apartment in order. And while I was doing that, I came across something that really confused me. In his apartment, I found two big bags. And in those bags were Starbucks cups. It said things like, welcome back, Pete. Come back soon. Have a nice day. And apparently these cups meant so much to my father, he couldn't bear to throw them away. And I just wanted to come and thank you for the obvious difference, the important difference you were making in his life. And so it begs the question, of course, what caused Pete to save the cups? It wasn't the location of the store, the speed of the service, the quality, or any of those things. It's these simple gestures of warmth towards others, towards our customers, towards our colleagues that cost us very little, but have a far greater impact on the experience and the loyalty and the emotions that we feel. Sure, it was warmth and competent. Sure, it was a great customer experience, but we should be aiming higher. What the top of the mountain, the thing, the pinnacle we should be aiming for is not just satisfaction, not just loyalty, but making a lasting difference in the lives of our customers and our colleagues. You get all the other business results and loyalty right along that if we make a lasting difference in the lives of our customers. And so, whether we realize it or not, whether we like it or not, every day we are all being judged on the basis of our warmth and competence. And despite the remarkable gift we've all been given to accurately perceive the intentions and abilities of others, we are equally cursed with blinders and an inability to accurately understand how we are coming across to others. And so in business every day, we are inadvertently doing things that are driving our customers away, whether it's the reduction of our service levels, the changing of our prices, our hours of operation, all of our policies, practices, and processes that for many years were perfectly standard in business are no longer acceptable. They send the message that we are a big, faceless monolith without any human compassion or goodwill, that all we care about is the bottom line and shareholder value. And so, if we're serious about delivering customer experiences that inspire and delivering lasting loyalty, I can boil it down to three imperatives for you. First, we're gonna to have to become much more aware of how our policies, practices, and processes come across from a warmth and competence standpoint. Many of the things that we do every day are creating a very transactional environment where our customers do not trust us and do not feel attached to us and are not loyal to us. Once we have that insight, we're gonna to have to be willing to make significant changes in the business processes and practices that we have taken for granted for many years. It's a different world. It's a world where, again, news travels further and faster about who we are and what we care about and how we treat people than ever before. And at the heart of it, frankly, we're gonna to have to look at our priorities because at the end of the day, it turns out that maximizing profit and shareholder value is not an aspiration that customers find very inspiring or very attractive from a loyalty standpoint. And I'm not suggesting that shareholders don't deserve a fair return and that companies should not make a profit, quite the reverse. But we cannot do so at the expense of our customers and employees. We must keep those priorities in balance with one another if we're going to be successful and sustain that over time. And so hopefully the moral of these stories is clear. In a world where our reputation and our brand can be won or lost in a single day with a click of a mouse, with a touch of a screen. Perhaps our ability to demonstrate warmth and competence to our customers is our greatest asset. And it makes sense in any human endeavor, personal, professional, or commercial, we have always depended on the loyalty and cooperation of others for our success. 
And again, this does not require us to recklessly disregard our own best interests, but rather keeping them in balance with those of our customers and our employees is simply enlightened self-interest, that by putting them first, we will gain more in the end. And so I challenge you, don't allow your organization, don't allow your organization to be just one more faceless monolith. Embrace the human brand that is within each of you and each of your organizations. And in doing so, you'll be able to deliver much more powerful customer experiences that generate lasting customer loyalty, but perhaps more importantly, give you the opportunity to make a lasting difference in the lives of your customers. I hope this is helpful. Thank you very much.